Today, I'm going to talk to you about sketchbooking as a self-compassion practice. I'm a big fan of rituals. I keep a habit tracker. I journal as often as I can, often using tarot cards as inspiration. And I love forming routines. So the sketchbook felt like a really good ritual to begin with. In May of 2023, I decided it was time to leave my job. Now, it took me six months later before I actually did it, but I spent three years unhappy and working on saving, planning, and figuring out how. I had hit a complete dead end. Getting long COVID meant that I couldn't keep doing the work that I loved, and that really was a blow. In the midst of grieving that loss, I was listening to a book by Kristen Neff called Fierce Self-Compassion. Self-compassion is a practice of being kind to yourself, being accepting and holding less judgment, particularly in moments of failure. In the book, Neff included this thing called the self-compassion assessment. And when I did it, (laughs) boy howdy, it made me realize I was really quite mean to myself. Neff taught me things like suffering, failure, and imperfection are part of the human experience, and I wanted to seek out connection rather than the isolation and unhealthy perspectives I cultivated where I used to work. The sketchbook became my big self-compassion project. It felt like a way to be mindful of what kinds of subject matter I'm most attracted to. I could experiment and play like a little kid, and I could begin to befriend that mean inner critic. So I want to say I'm not self-taught. I went to art school, and that's really where the inner critic was cultivated on a pretty deep level. Each semester, I would have between three and seven critique days, where I would share my recent work with my professors and my peers to get feedback. Because of this being in academia, a world full of prestige and egos, the egos of others drove a lot of the conversation. Our participation in critique was part of our grades, So that meant a lot of the critique spaces centered the voices of white men and their views on what good art is. I went to a school that focused on traditional painting techniques, but every single critique without fail, my desire to do things like work from photo references or simply paint representationally was questioned. I would respond defensively because my grade was on the line too. I knew eventually I wanted to teach and share with others the various techniques I was learning. I wanted to go deep into learning the methods and strategies of painters I was learning about and admiring in art history. The loudest voices in the room, however, followed the path laid out by publications like Art Forum and the views of high-end galleries in New York. I grew up working class, and the last place I ever saw myself was in a high-end gallery. Often, when I found myself at fancy art openings, I felt such a deep lack of belonging. When I tried reading Art Forum back then, I felt like I was chewing on my cheek. The language was garbled and othering. I couldn't understand where or why this was the pinnacle of art making. This type of writing or way to make art was so valued highly, but it was so alienating and sterile. I found some of my peers giving into peer pressure and bullying to conform their work to these standards. Yet I stood firmly in my desire to learn technical skills despite all the pressure to abandon that and follow the trends. In a weird twist of fate, my aversion to this type of clinical and theory-laden art writing ended up leading me right into becoming an art critic. Sort of on accident. I interned for a gallery that was hosting lectures by established local artists and curators in a hot tub. It was wild, unexpected, informal, and felt authentic and silly. I was so inspired by this. It was incredibly counter to what I had witnessed in arts publications that the elite held in such high regard. I wrote about each of the lectures, and I was entranced by a different side of the art world that felt informal and approachable. This was the place I found belonging. Not long after, I started covering local exhibitions for my department's blog, and this new version of art criticism that I was creating felt like an act of love to the work that I found around me that was so exciting. I could review and ground things and cultural ideas that would inspire anyone, even non-artists. My grandmother didn't go to art school, but she was a painter, and she would read everything I wrote on my blogs and text me if she understood it. 
That was a perfect barometer for me to write in a way that grounded art in a context for real people. Because I found my niche as an art writer, after I graduated, I put my own artwork on hold to start an arts publication and try to make being an art critic a full-time job. It was a fun experiment. I called the publication Informality with the mission of bringing the informal and informative to contemporary art conversations. I learned so much about being a better writer, how to support other writers, how to facilitate better programming and be a better teacher, and how to deepen connections with local artists. It also led me to some interesting opportunities to connect on unexpected ways with the Kansas City art community. Eventually, though, after several years of selling shoes at Nordstrom to pay my writers, I realized that work was never going to pay my bills. I couldn't secure regular funding, and I didn't have the connections to form a nonprofit. The practice of becoming a critic also ended up really calcifying biases, opinions, and perspectives that I inherited from those around me. These people in my community made amazing work and had great opinions. I looked up to them. I was young and impressionable, searching for belonging. When I passed the project on to one of my senior editors, though, I came back to making art. But it was hard, with all of the new voices of artists in my community that I had in my head. Back then, I would sketch, but on my computer, opening various tabs and windows to create compositions. This was my screenshot series. I would collect images I loved on Tumblr, fragments of writing, parts of text messages, and then these screenshot sketches became my first way to play in a really long time. I started to slowly come out of my shell, but this work was held back by my loud inner critic, who was the center of my life for seven years. I needed to make sure that this work would fit the expectations of the fine art world. I wanted to teach and have a creative practice as my life, and those around me said, the MFA is the only way to do that. The work was risky and different, but so controlled to try and fit the expectations of MFA admissions counselors. I often tell people that I'm an anxious painter, but I think this stemmed from a deep lack of self-trust and brutal inner criticism, a lack of self-compassion. I found the digital space to always be my safe place. Even when I was an undergrad, I could plan everything out with undo buttons and versioning. I could make a painting in Photoshop, trace the edges, and perfectly lay it out on my canvas before I even touched paint. Part of this, I think, came from the fear around the stereotype of the starving artist and the immense expense of materials. But truly, this anxiety was cultivated from the relentless bullying and emotional abuse that I endured in art school. The body of work I made ended up not getting me to graduate school, and that failure coincided with an opportunity to work at Apple teaching free digital painting workshops. This was great. I had just had two solo shows and sold one painting. I was kind of burnt out from all of my attempts in the art world, and I was really excited to teach creativity. I loved that role while it lasted, but it ended up disintegrating into something I didn't like, as many arts programs do under capitalism. Last May, when I was making the decision to leave my job and figuring out the how, I had two main focuses. One, figuring out my resources. The money. How the heck was I going to support myself? And two, what my income streams would be, realistically. I was watching a ton of videos by Kelsey Rodriguez here on YouTube, and I purchased her artist business plan Notion template. I'm going to put a link in the description to it because it's seriously awesome. And if you're frustrated at your job and you're thinking of making a leap, you should check it out too. The thing I like about Notion, and this template in general, is that all of a sudden, my anxious planner self, that same person who wanted to make every painting in Photoshop first, instead could come to life on this spreadsheet. All of a sudden, I was starting to think about different types of income streams, ways of figuring out passive versus active income, conversations that never happened at art school. Well, I had some friends who were in the fiber department, and they got lots of lessons on how to post things to Etsy and how to create slightly more sustainable business models. When I was going to art school back in 2013, everything was so focused on how to participate in the traditional gallery system or how to find ways 
to wedge yourself into academia. But with both of those paths, I had friends and close mentors who would follow them, get frustrated, find themselves burnt out, feeling really unhealthy. I saw depression running rampant. I saw friends of mine who had prestigious positions but were on food stamps. And I have a chronic illness, so for me, that was never going to be okay. And that was before getting long COVID. So I realized that I was basically taught to exist within a system that would not support me financially. I had professors who would regularly use my CV, my artist resume, as an example in their professional practice classes of what success was for their students. But then I would meet with these students for coffee, and they would be shocked to hear all of my prestigious projects led to no financial benefit. And that's just the way things were. But looking at this template, all of a sudden, I started to think differently. I could build a structure for my art practice completely separate from that traditional world. I could define and clarify how I'd make money, and I could actually take the risk and be an artist full-time. At this point, once I had finished the template and talked about it a lot with my partner, commissions started rolling in. I got to work on really cool projects. In-person classes that I launched were filling up, and with the buffer of my savings, I started to invest in building a pop-up shop for Bay Area markets. I was going to finally focus on selling my work, rather than contorting who I was and the work that I made, to fill the expectations and in institutions of corporations I did not belong in. Back in art school, I remember returning from a trip to the Bay Area and making sketch after sketch after sketch in my sketchbook at the time of the landscape, the city of San Francisco, and just being truly enamored. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, I am so inspired by that land, I would love to live there. But I was discouraged, left and right, from both my parents and my professors. This is a really expensive place to live. I don't know if that's going to be possible for you. And then there was also the Bay Area figurative painters, the landscape painters. And I so deeply wished I could be someone like Richard Diebenkorn. I dreamed of being the San Francisco Bay Area version of Lois Dodd or Fairfield Porter. And that just sat in the back of my head. But one of the advantages of working at Apple is that it allowed me to relocate to this place that I've always loved. And now it gets to be the deep center of all of my work and my inspiration. So to the sketchbook, I found this leather bound notebook that my partner had lying around and I decided I'm gonna try sketching again. I had never truly cultivated the habit since undergrad and getting discouraged from ever going to San Francisco, but I decided to really go for it. My previous focuses were so hyper-productive and only thought about work I'm making in terms of its productivity and turnaround time, and sketching felt extraneous. But if I really sat down and thought about it, the artists that I loved and admired kept sketchbooks. It helped them develop a coherent visual language that felt key to their success and growth. After my long days of selling cables instead of teaching at Apple, I would come home and instead of being sad, I would watch YouTube videos of sketchbook tours and I would get so inspired and excited seeing people actually share this really vulnerable part of their practice and see the ways that it was actually making an impact on the work they were making. They had distinct visual languages, and I thought that was seriously cool. So for me now, sketchbooking is essential. It's the space where I hang out with my little kid's self and cultivate self-compassion. I've learned to be kinder to myself while playing with colored pencils, alcohol markers, and my leftover acrylic paint. But this time I don't have the undo button anymore. Procreate on my iPad was a great pre-sketchbook experience for me, and I'll definitely make a video about that later on. But this physical sketchbooking practice 
has been so important for me to connect deeply with my inner kid, the one who got the rose art super art set and carried it with them everywhere they could. And now as an adult, I can play in my sketchbook, deeply love this landscape, and embrace the magic of what happens. Hopefully, this story inspires you to also start the habit of building a sketchbook and continue on your dream of making and creating art. And remember not to give up. If you like this video and what I shared, feel free to let me know in the comments. Let me know if you have any questions, and I'd love to respond to them in a future video. Happy to share all that I can and all of that knowledge that I garnered in art school. And if you're considering sketching and need some helpful motivation, I've got a little group just for you. I've started a virtual sketchbooking club. It's totally free. It's on Thursday evenings, and I'm looking to do additional dates to be more inclusive to additional time zones. So let me know times that work for you if the current one doesn't. But you can sign up with the Eventbrite link in this video description. If you want to keep following along with my adventure here, Go ahead and subscribe to this video, maybe like it, and until next time, thanks for watching.